is 6.30, and so it's time to uh, call to order the regular meeting of the West Valley City Council and let the roll call show that all members of the council are present, with the exception of Mayor Winder, who has asked to be excused. And joining us on the dais tonight, uh, representing the staff, is City Manager Wayne Pyle, and uh, doing the recording duties is our esteemed city recorder, Ms. Sherry McKendrick. Uh, and just uh, by way of order, we'll immediately following the city council meeting, we will be having a uh, brief uh, West Valley City Redevelopment uh, Agency meeting uh, as soon as this meeting is concluded. Uh, by, by way of opening ceremony, this is a task that uh, we take turns as council members to set the tone and, and uh, uh, start off the meeting. And tonight's uh, opening ceremony fell to uh, Mayor Winder, who has arranged to have Pastor Daryl Evans of uh, Oasis Vineyard come. And so, Pastor, would you come up and the floor is yours. Good evening. I'm here to open the prayer tonight, so uh, if you don't mind, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we invite your presence. We ask for your wisdom, your guidance. I pray, Father, that as your word exhorts us to pray for those in uh, authority in our government, our city, I pray that your wisdom would be here, your grace, your, uh, your attitude towards the best for our people. And we just pray for your wisdom again, your guidance, your understanding. And we pray for this time. We submit it to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. It's noted that uh, uh, Pastor Evans is a West Valley resident and serves the community. And we, we thank you for your uh, invocation as well as your service. Um, there are no special recognitions tonight, which usually is for visiting uh, dignitaries or uh, scouts, which we hold in uh, equal esteem. And so seeing none of them, we'll move on to uh, item number five, which is the approval of our regular meeting minutes from March 27th, 2012. Council members. Motion to approve uh, the approval of minutes March 27th, 2012. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the March 27th uh, Meet, meeting minutes as presented. All in favor, please say aye. 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 It appears to be unanimous. Uh, from time to time, we like to uh, invite all new employees into uh, the council chamber to be introduced. And so, um, with that, we'll turn the time over to City Manager Wayne Pyle to, for the introduction of our new employees. Okay, thank you, sir. I get an unusual opportunity tonight. Paul is down in St. George representing me at a conference, and I don't think Amy or uh, anybody from the HR office is here, so I'm going to actually do the introductions tonight. And not knowing beforehand I was going to do this, hopefully I won't mispronounce anybody's name. But if I do, I apologize beforehand. And what we'd like you to do is if any of the employees that are here that are, uh, that, that whose names I call off, if you would just please stand and be recognized so we can see who you are and welcome here to the city. Uh, we would like to do that and recognize you. I'd also just like to add the comment that uh, we're very proud of our employee group and uh, we uh, recruit and we develop very good people and we enjoy and love having them. I know that's a big part of the enjoyment of my job that I have is working with these folks every day. So welcome to the city. Okay, from Public Works, we have Michael Haskell and Jeffrey Peterson. Are either of you here? Oh, thanks, very. Both of you are, that's right, very good. Nice to have you here. Uh, from fire, we have Alex Grazer. Ah, just met Alex out in the hall, but didn't realize he was brand new. Nice to have you with us there. Uh, from legal, we've got Daniel Strong. Daniel, how are you? Community preservation, we've got Catherine Hills and Andre Gameros. Very good. Thank you very much. Hope I didn't mess up either of your names there. And for police, we have Carly James, Hannah Prigmeyer, and Julie Smith. Okay, they're not with us tonight, but we extend that same welcome to them as well. So thanks very much again. I appreciate you taking a few minutes to be here this evening, and thanks for the uh, efforts and uh, contribution you're going to make to our city. Appreciate it. Okay, Mayor. Thank you. And uh, we as the City Council uh, welcome you to the West Valley City family and hope that you find uh, successes and joys in your serving, and this is where we institute the intelligence test, and uh, where we give you the option to uh, leave if you so desire, but you are welcome to stay to, to see how the meeting goes, but again, welcome. 
Okay, we have a couple uh, very special uh, awards uh, ceremonies tonight. And so, uh, Mr. Powell, do you want to uh, turn the time over to or give any uh, introductory comments to uh, item A, which is uh, the Utah Recreations and Parks Association? Um, Mayor, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, what I'll do is just turn the, the uh, mic over to Kevin for a sec if okay. he wants to make any introduction. Okay, thanks, you guys. Um, who we have here with us tonight is the president, of the uh, or uh, past president of the Utah Recreation and Parks Association, Kim Olson. At, at our recent conference, uh, awards were given out, and we were fortunate enough to be the recipient of one of the coveted awards. So Kim will present that to us tonight. Hey, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Honorable Members of City Council, it's great to be here with you. I am Kim Olson. I'm currently the Executive Director of the Utah Recreation and Park Association. Uh, we are a nonprofit professional association of all the recreation parks and leisure professionals in the state of Utah. Uh, we are also the state affiliate of the National Recreation Parks Association, which uh, has their headquarters back in Washington, D.C. Uh, over 19,000 members that, that we, you know, we lobby through Congress for and other areas for parks and recreation issues. Anyway, uh, one of our, our major uh, activities here in the state is uh, an annual conference where we have training classes, uh, opportunities for uh, people to network and, and learn about others in recreation. But we also like to recognize some of the excellent uh, programs within the state. We always, each year we present a, uh, an outstanding department. There are three divisions, one, two, and three. Uh, three is 50,000 and over. And uh, this year, after examining your department here in West Valley City, all aspects of their programming, their facilities, uh, the way they do things, their, a lot of their staff and the expertise they have. Uh, our uh, uh, judges uh, selected West Valley City as the outstanding department, uh, class three for 2012. Uh, now Mayor, if you'd like to come, I'd like to present this to you on behalf of, of the Recreation Park Association and then you can possibly present it to your staff. Congratulations. I'd like to just one more thing. Usually, when you're selected for an award from your peers, they know what you do, they know what goes into it, and I think this means even more coming from your peers than some outside group. So, this is truly an honor for your department. Thank you. So, if, if you want to call them? I will. I, I think they're all. Hurt. I'm going to show you my okay. parks and rec acumen by <laughs> jumping back up here. And we have a number of members from our parks and recreation department here, and it might probably be appropriate if they would stand up and be known, make themselves known. So these, these are the faces of uh, West Valley City Parks and Rec, and they did a fabulous, uh, they do a fabulous job year over year, and I'm sure they'll find that. Uh, present this over to uh, Parks Director Kevin Astle. I'm sure they'll find a place of honor down at uh, one of our many recreation facilities and yes. enjoy it for years to come. And also it'll be a, a, a standard for them to uh, continue their uh, uh, high works from. So thank you. Okay, we do have a, another special uh, recognition tonight, and this comes from uh, uh, all the way, I guess, from Washington, D.C., in some, in some regards, because we have us, Senator uh, Mike Lee's Deputy State Director, Bill Lee, here, and so Bill will turn the time over to uh, you at this point. In uh, recognition of our city police officers receiving the Utah Gang Unit of the Year Award. Thank you. It's great to be here in your city. Mayor Pro Tem and the City Council and also members of the city. It's an honor to be here and to, to recognize good things that happen 
in a, in a world sometimes where it's filled with uh, things that uh, are not so pleasant and they get pushed around all over the place. Senator Mike Lee has uh, engaged us to look for things that are done well. And so, and so with that, um, with those that are going to receive that, the, uh, the law enforcement, they would come up. Is there somebody here to receive that? Yeah. It's recognition for West Valley City and their game task force. force. And, and when the thing that says in here for the dedication and bravery of Utah law enforcement personnel exemplifies the best in Utah. And so with that, the senator would like to present this to your city, to your task force for a job well done. that uh, very special uh, recognition Mr. Lee and we appreciate the uh, the works and the, the partnerships that we've had uh, with the senator's office and we'll, we'll continue to have. Um, item C is a proclamation to designate April 16, 2012 through April 20th as Community Development Block Grant Week here in West Valley City and and we've asked uh, Council Member Steve Bueller representing District 2 to read that proclamation on our behalf. Councilman. Thank you. A proclamation designating April 16, 2012 through April 20, 2012 as Community Development Block Grant Week. Whereas the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, program was enacted and signed into law by President Gerald Ford as the centerpiece of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974. And whereas the CDBG program has as its primary objective the development of viable urban communities by providing decent housing and a suitable living environment and expanding economic opportunities principally for persons of low and moderate income. And whereas the CDBG program has considerable flexibility to allow communities to carry out activities that are tailored to their unique affordable housing and neighborhood revitalization needs. And whereas West Valley City, with CDBG funds in the approximate amount of $24,084,145 since 1989, has provided for low moderate income housing for families and seniors, parks, streets, public services, and neighborhood services. Now therefore, we the Mayor and City Council of West Valley City do hereby proclaim the week of April 16, 2012 through April 20, 2012 as Community Development Block Grant Week and encourage all citizens to join together in expressing support for the Community Development Block Grant Program. Thank you, Councilman. Um, at this point in time, if there's no objections, I'd like to go back on the agenda uh, special recognitions as I see two scouts have joined us here, two familiar looking scouts, and uh, I presume they're working on a merit badge, and so uh, uh, what we like to do is know a little bit about them, who they are, why they're here, what troop uh, you're from and roughly what part of the city you live in which uh, sometimes is best accomplished by stating what school you come to so what school you attend and so is there a, one of the boys a designated spokesman or patrol senior patrol leader that would like to be spokesman for this group come on up here to the microphone so we can uh, get a better look at you and then and all the people that are watching uh, on channel 17 or on the internet can get a good look at the back of your head. <laughs> I'm Ashley Nelson. I'm from, I go to Kennedy Junior High. I'm from Troop 766. And what, are you working on a requirement tonight? Working on community and the citizenship in the community. Okay. Well, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight, and, and I hope it's an educational experience for you. And so now we'll turn to uh, item 7, which is our public comment period, and this is the time we set aside each meeting to allow comments uh, from members of the public, and we have a half hour set aside, and um, we have a sign-up <coughs> sheet, and uh, so Josh Sherman is our long sign-up, and so Josh has been here before, and so you want to come up and uh, state, state your name and address, and then we'll uh, start your five minutes or so. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Josh Sherman. I'm at 3919 South, 40 Enter West, West Valley City, 84120. And I couldn't be with a better group of individuals tonight. The Scout, working on the citizenship in the community. The bear badge right here. And the Park and Recs, which I champion. Thank you for coming here and being here. Thank you for what you do as well, all of you. And to the two new city council members, Karen, we met last week, and then Tom, pleasure to meet you. For everyone else, and for the mayor, and Wayne, and Kevin Astle, and everyone else here, it's out of hibernation time, so I've come to talk to you again. Um, actually, sorry, I forgot my message. So if I can indulge you, um, just for five minutes. I timed this to down to five minutes, so I hope not to exceed that amount of time. So, for everyone else, thank you for indulging me as well. For the last 10 years, I've come before the City Council and hope that I can, in some way, persuade the City Council and the City of West Valley to build a skate park in the city where I was born and raised. Shortly after the Olympics, I attended the meeting and asked Mayor Nordfeld to help fund a skate park. At the time, I turned out, as it turned out, one was already being partially funded by the ZAP program in the city. In 2004, the skate park was designed and shovel ready. Unfortunately, due to comments made by the Taylorsville mayor that were overheard by Mayor Nordfeld, funding was pulled. Today, the skate park remains at the bottom of the city's project list. In 2010, another opportunity was presented, Proposition 3, a $25 million open space bond was introduced by the city council. If passed, it would have funded 17 new neighborhood parks, 27 miles of trails, and a four to seven acre community village square. Also included was funding to build a skate park. At the time, I skateboarded around my neighborhood and various other neighborhoods, distributing pamphlets that detailed the improvements and conveying the message that we were, as a city, investing in future generations in the open spaces of West Valley City. Unfortunately, the voted the public voted against the increase in property taxes and the proposal was voted down. Over the past 15 years, while we've struggled to find funding for a city skate park, 52 other cities in our state have managed to vote on and fund city skate parks in their respective areas. I've written to many of the mayors and park and recreation departments of each of these cities. In some cases, there were issues with citizens' expenses, but each response I've received has made two things very clear. The governing party was in favor of the decision, and they feel it's been a solid investment for the city. And I've included those letters into the pamphlet I gave you as well. In 2011, the total revenue for West Valley City was $63 million, which although down from the previous year has increased with the growth of our city for the last 10 years. Our total revenue managed, manages the second largest city in the state, a third of that budget goes to the police at $20 million, which I do respect, but it's a, a lot of money. Unfortunately, park and recreation is at the very bottom of the budget, just above legislative expenditures at $1.6 million. We've managed to implement some incredible recreational sites. In 1991, the city voted to build the first public golf course called Westridge, which is currently under construction and slated to open in 2013. In 1997, the citizens of West Valley began to pay for the construction of the E-Center, which houses indoor soccer, football, wrestling, figure skating, concerts, and is the home to most notably the Utah Grizzlies. Before the Y2K scare, the citizens also put up the bond to build the Centennial Park, complete with an impressive fitness center, indoor, outdoor swimming, two quad softball facilities, tennis courts, soccer fields, basketball, climbing wall, and a rugby field. Having seen the host of the world's best hockey players during the Olympics, the city purchased Stone Bridge Golf Course. It would be the second public golf course within the city limits. Today, our city is home to a total of 152 acres of public parks, 14 pavilions, 24 playgrounds, two golf courses, 15 tennis courts, 14.5, I don't know how you can have a .5 basketball court, 10 soccer fields, 15 softball diamonds, West Ball has funded the arts and parks via the bonds and has built the Hell Theater, East Center, Fitness Club, Harmon Home Golf Courses, and the Maverick Center. These bonds are paid for out of this general fund for the beautification of our city and recreation of our citizens. 
There are currently 20 elementary schools, four junior high schools, and two high schools in the city boundaries. More notably, 35% of the population is under 19 years of age, with an additional 16% between 20 and 29 years old. This accounts for 51% of our population that is under 30 years old. Many of whom are starting their own families, and I believe this next generation needs a place to meet, a place to find acceptance in the alternative sports. The future population of West Valley is expected to reach 140,000 by 2020. Upcoming projects slated to be built include trail and bike segments, the Bangador overpass, park equipment, structure renovation, fitness center equipment, and the city center urban park, which is already being built west of the project here. All of these are funded by taxpayers, and I strongly believe that the population demand also calls for a skate park for a greater size to be considered. Currently, the proposal for the fiscal year 2013 for the development of skate park at Centennial Park for the amount of $500,000, which I believe is adequate for the construction of the park. Additional capital investment for 2014 included construction of a skate park on the east side of the city as an accent to the city center. I propose the development of both parks move forward to accommodate the anticipated growth in developed and undeveloped areas of the city. I'd like to note something as well, which I believe is paramount importance. In addition to funding a city skate park, the citizens and skate community can be proud of. I think it's incredibly important that the design and construction of the park be taken in consideration. At some point in the timeline of city skate park construction, it was determined that the passion of skateboarding is a cause for concern and should be monitored. Fences were placed around skate parks to control behavior, a silent statement that crime was somehow already at play. Placing fences around skate parks can send a very distinct and negative message. In doing so, the assumption is made that the participants are more delinquent than soccer players, more truant than football players, or more inclined to vandalize than tennis players. Those, include, those inclined to skateboard haven't fallen in traditional sports, but they're recreating amongst peers nevertheless. Like gymnasts or swimmers, they're sharpening a specific and difficult skill. As with football and rugby players, they're encouraging and challenging one another. More importantly, they possess the same heart and desire to perform, no different than any other athlete that gives 100% to their craft. I believe that rules should be enforced so long as they're consistent with other enforced by the city in other organized sports or city-owned parks. If the tennis and basketball courts are lit until 10 p.m., so should the skate parks. If a skate park is subject to lockdown for graffiti, litter, and vandalism, every park in our city should be held to the same high standards. For more than 35 years, skateboarding has gained momentum in mainstream society. More than 20 million people around the world skateboard. With, major, with the majority continue to grow each year. Along I-15, you can find at least three billboards that feature skateboarders. It's a worthy of the city investment as any other sport. And citizen demand calls for it increasingly. With the growing number of kids hooked on video games and non-recreational activities, we as a city should be championing any sport that gets kids outdoors and active. I feel incredibly strongly that this time has come to follow suit for those 50 plus cities that have chosen to invest in alternative sports and encourage an energetic and positive lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you. We see by your colorful, colorful t-shirts, there's a, a few supporters that uh, are in solidarity with that statement, but we just show a hand who's here that uh, support Josh's statements there. A couple of few add-ons there at the end. All, all of our staff over there. Great. Great. <laughs> thank you for being here and your, your continued work and, and concern for the, for the, the area. Um, seeing no other sign-ups for the public comment period, that uh, we'll move on to item nine, which is a new business to hear and consider an appeal from Aaron Falk of the Salt Lake Tribune. So, Mr. Pyle, do you want to introduce uh, that process for us now? Yes, thanks, Mayor. I'll try to do that uh, simply and, and uh, without a whole lot of fanfare. This is only the second time that we've had one of these uh, 
uh, appeal to the council level. So I apologize if I don't do this in a, in a very formal manner, but uh, I think I can handle this and, and get, the, get, get us moving along fairly quickly. Mr. Falk uh, from the Tribune has uh, appealed the denial of his grandma request. Uh, this has happened twice, first in his initial appeal, I'm mean, sorry, his initial request through the police department, and then the first appeal, which is made to my office. Um, I upheld, upheld the police department's uh, denial, and then uh, the appeal was made to use the city council. Just for a uh, little bit of background information on how that will conduct, uh, and also an answer to one of Mr. Falk's requests through the, the correspondence that we got from him. Mr. Falk had uh, requested that we hire outside legal counsel to represent the city. Um, we did not do that, but what we have done is we actually um, have used this mechanism in a number of other situations in the past. As we've erected what in the legal community they call a Chinese wall between two of our, um, um, our um, attorneys within our attorney's office. Mr. Eric Bunderson, who is sitting at the table behind me and is the city's attorney, will represent the city council in any interest or advice or whatever you may need or request for purposes of this uh, appeal or this matter. Whereas Mr. Clint uh, Gilmore, who uh, currently works in our prosecutor's office, is going to advocate the uh, PD's position or the appeals position on the side of, uh, of that question there. And uh, never the twain shall meet in terms of the, the whole Chinese wall concept. They've not discussed this and, and they've uh, maintained a separation there. I also, for my part, having been the first level of appeal, won't be commenting or taking part in the discussion other than to just do this, introduce, uh, and whatever and whatever kind of logistical need we may have. Uh, there was one other point I wanted to make sure I brought up, and I'm kind of missing it. Can't remember what it was right now. But Mr. Falk, did you have somebody else who was here with you? Yeah, you this wanted to do this? Okay, very good. And that did actually remind me of the one other point I had. Go ahead. I was going to say, I may also be addressing the council on some specific points. Okay, and then the, the one other matter I just wanted to ask is, Mr. Bunderson, is there anything from a procedural standpoint that you wanted to or needed to point out as we proceed forward? How, how would you like this to proceed in terms of presentation? Sure. Um, the, uh, the, the council's free to, to under our ordinances to, to handle the hearing however they want. Um, my recommendation would be to handle it somewhat like a um, uh, appeals court type hearing where you would allot a certain amount of time to each party and then allow them um, to split it up however they want. If Mr. Falk wants to, to open and save five minutes for Mr. Carlisle or if he wants to um, uh, save five minutes for rebuttal after Mr. Gilmore's presentation, um, that's all allowable. Um, so it's really very much up to the uh, to the council how they want to do it. But that, I think that would be uh, that would be my advice on how to proceed procedurally. Okay, thanks, Mr. Bunderson. That seems to fit fairly generally with how we've uh, seen other proceedings of this matter uh, go forward in the past. So let me ask Mr. Falk this: How long would you like to have from a presentation standpoint? You know, I, I think I could make. I was hoping to make a, just a quick opening statement. I, I believe you all have. The documentation that we send in advance. Um, if I can just hit on a few points that to, uh, to emphasize some what, what that is in the, uh, the supporting documents, and then um, if, 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 I guess if, if it's handed over to uh, I'm sorry, I your name. Mr. Gilmore. Yeah, Mr. Gilmore. Uh, and, and and then if we could reserve for for rebuttal at the end. Sounds good. So what do you think? Ten minutes, twenty minutes? Got any idea? We, I mean, I, I probably. Make my openings in less than five, and then we've really okay. Ten minutes for, for a All right. Well, why don't we just plan on that, and then we'll let Mr. Gilmore speak. Go ahead, Mr. Carlisle. Just better clarify. We don't anticipate calling any witnesses. If the city anticipates calling witnesses, we'll need some time to uh, ask some questions of those witnesses. And uh, let me ask Mr. Gilmore that question. Where are you planning? Okay. All right. So they're not planning on doing that either. So we'll do. We'll proceed that. We'll let's say ten minutes to start. Mr. Gilmore, 10 minutes, um, then we'll let you rebut or, or bring any other information. Want the same with Mr. Gilmore. Does that sound 
acceptable to the council or would you like it run in another way? You know, I, I think that that was kind of what we had in mind and, and how we've handled situations like this in the past to have it, but then, you know, I think what we'd like to do is once kind of the arguments are out there is just to have both parties be available for any questions from the council. Okay. Okay. So okay. with that, well, yeah, sounds good. is there any other input on this on procedure of the council here then? Or other than I think I'd like to have our attorney come sit up here where we can see him. Okay. No objections to that. Mm -hmm. Stop and, and, hiding behind the chair. And I don't, for myself, I'm not particularly worried about time. Right. Just right. Uh, let's hear what has to be said. And and I'm not trying to limit either. I was just trying to get a general feel. I, I mean, re realizing that the longer we have to sit here, <laughs> right, so. I'm, uh, I, I'll be, I'm, I'm well aware of the, the importance of your time, so I, I appreciate it. Um, Council, like, we're here, we're asking for records pertaining to Josh Powell, who in the two years and, and four months since his wife's disappearance has been the sole person of interest, at least, at least made public, um, by, by your police department. Um, this is a request that the Salt Lake Tribune has not made before in this time. Um, it wasn't until February of this year when Josh Powell set fire to his home in Washington. Uh, in that fire, his two sons were killed. And Mr. Powell also perished, and, and with him went any chance that he will ever be prosecuted criminally in this case. But what tonight is about is the public records laws of this state, and since that's something that we probably don't all deal with every day, um, we could just hit on a few points here. First of all, a record is to be presumed public. You cannot presume that a record is not public and then seek validation for that perspective. Secondly, we've been twice denied uh, this request, as, as Mr. Pyle mentioned, but with each level of, of appeal, we are entitled to a, uh, to a review anew um, and I imagine there are a lot of documents in, in this case file. I'm, I'm not privy to that, but uh, and I apologize. But unfortunately, that means you guys have to do your own work on, on this level as well. Um, the law and the court rulings also hold that, that I'm entitled to a fair and impartial hearing. And while you are representatives of, of this city, um, I don't feel you can give more weight to, or consideration to, to the police or to the city's interest than to the, what the Tribune has to say. Um, if you find the records in question meet the definition under grandma of a private record, you are not obligated to, to stick with that classification. Uh, grandma makes clear that municipalities can release protected records if they see there's a public interest. Um, in fact, I believe your city's own code has, has similar language, and your city's own policy uh, boasts of transparency above and beyond the minimums required by the state's law. Um, this case means a great deal to the people of, of this state and, and of the city. These are people who spent a, a lot of time uh, posting flyers, who, who have shed a lot of tears over this, who have, um, who, who have contributed aid through tax dollars. And we, we've asked, we've never received an estimate as to how much has been spent on this case. We don't expect an answer that, to that tonight. But I, I believe the people of, of the city um, are entitled to a, a general idea of how or of how that money was spent, and that would be through, through these records. Um, finally, if uh, these points notwithstanding, and, and my arguments notwithstanding, if you see fit um, after, a, after a fair hearing and, and a good faith review, um, that these documents are, some of these documents are protected, we would ask that we have a discussion as to um, redaction or, or a way of, of segregating some of the documents that, that may, that apply to the, the case that remains active, but um, might no longer be protected because they don't apply to the deceased Mr. Powell. Um, those, I mean, those would be my basic points. So you have my uh, supporting documents with with the code cited. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to Mr. Gilmore. Mr. Gilmore, Mr. Gilmore, my apologies.
don't mind being called Mr. Bunderson. <laughs> Most people don't know who I am anyway. I'm a prosecutor. My name is Clint Gilmore. I'm the assistant chief prosecutor for your fine city. Um, was recently given that title. Um, I am also the police legal advisor. Um, I've had that title for less than a year. Um, I reviewed the appeal letter that was uh, given. I believe that's the documentation that you've been provided. I don't know if there were any um, uh, attachments to that, but I had a six page review or uh, appeal letter that was forwarded to me, I believe by Ms. McKendrick, um, that I was forwarded to me yesterday afternoon that I, I've had a chance to review. Is that the documentation that you have as well? All right. In response um, to, the, uh, to the letter um, made by Mr. Falk, um, a couple of things. Number one, it's true that the disappearance of uh, Susan Cox Powell has generated significant media interest. Um, it's also understandable in light of the events that occurred on February 5th of this year um, that media interest in this case has intensified. It's also true that uh, he put in his letter that uh, West Valley City has a long and rich um, history of being more open than uh, state grandma laws require. We try uh, we strive for transparency in our government. We strive for transparency in the activities of the police department. Um, transparent, transparency in government has its value as it relates especially to public trust. However, in a departure to the tone and substance of uh, Mr. Falk's letter, um, I believe it's worth emphasizing that the investigation being conducted by the West Valley City Police Department is about the disappearance of Susan Cox Powell. Um, we still need to know where Susan is. She remains missing, and the West Valley City Police Department re remains engaged and committed to the thorough investigation of her case. We want to know what happened to her and pursue any evidence that leads us to anyone who might have been criminally involved in her disappearance. This investigation is not the Josh Powell investigation. This is not the Josh Powell case. Our, our case is about Susan, and she remains our focus. West Valley City Police Department recognizes the rationale behind the public's interest in Susan's case and including the media interest. And I guess tonight we're here to respond um, specifically to the statutory requirements or the statutory um, presumptions under grandma. Um, grandma, some people call it grandma, grandma. Uh, it stands for the Government Records um, Access and Management Act. That's what grandma stands for. Um, you know, I don't know how long I am a resident of West Valley City. I recognize a couple of new faces, but I've only been before you a couple of times when I was a brand new employee about seven years ago and a couple other times. I don't normally appear in these kinds of settings. I'm usually in court, but grandma, so I'm not sure how familiar you are with grandma, but uh, that's what it stands for. That's what the acronym stands for. West Valley City Police Department supports the rationale behind grandma. We believe not only in the appropriate access to, but the appropriate management um, of government records. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, grandma is about both ideals. It's not just about access, give us access, give us access. It's also about the management of those records, management of the access um, to those records. And sometimes those two ideals can conflict with each other, depending on what the objective is of those, of those reports and documents. So I'm hoping you're aware that grandma is a state law um, it's not a federal law, it's a state law, and it's found under Title 63G of the Utah Code. You're going to see some codes cited in that appeal letter. Under Section 63G2305, a little bit of a lesson, the 63G is the title, 2 is the chapter, 305 is the section. So we generally refer to that as Section 63G2305. Grandma defines what is to be considered protected documents, okay, as opposed to public documents. Um, certain documents, by their very nature, grandma has outlining management to the access to those documents and defines those documents as protected, meaning we're not just going to release these. And it outlines rationale why it's not going to release those. It's worth noting that it has been and remains the position of the West Valley City Police Department that the records sought by the appellant are protected under 63G2305. In defining those records, um, in defining what protected records are, Title 63G says protected records, and then it goes into its 
subsections and says, hey, these are the different records that are going to be um, considered protected. In subsection 9 of 63G2305, it states in relevant part, and you can't see my notes, um, I have taken out through dot, 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 parts that don't, don't deal with the kind of records that we deal with in the West Valley City. And I'm going to read it as though um, it were just um, dealing with West Valley City Police Department records. It says, under 63G2305, subsection 9, records created or maintained for dot, 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 criminal dot, 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 enforcement purposes, and remember this is defining what protected records are, so these records are um, protected if release of the records, A, reasonably could be expected to interfere with investigations for enforcement purposes, okay? If there's an ongoing investigation and the release of these records would interfere with that ongoing investigation, these records should be protected. B, they could, if they could also reasonably could be expected to inf interfere with enforcement proceedings, criminal enforcement proceedings um, by statutory um, interpretation is what we're referring to. So investigation for enforcement, enforcement proceedings, um, or three would create the danger of depriving a person of a right to a fair trial. In the event that somebody were to be charged and we were to release these records, the public would be able to consume, or it would be open for public consumption, stuff that is irrelevant to the actual case. And if that person's um, um, predilection for porn, for whatever it is, could taint a potential jury pool. So it's there also to protect a future person who might get charged in a future criminal proceeding. Four, reasonably could be expected to disclose the identity of a source is the fourth, the identity of a source. And this could be an individual or this could be an institutional source. Could be a police department that is, um, we have contacted and they have given us um, source information. It could be a um, search engine um, program, whatever, that leads us to information as we are investigating a case not generally known outside of the government. Why is that important? Well, it's important to protect if it's an individual. Um, it's also important to protect police procedures, which is also covered in E or the fifth reason. That could reasonably be expected to disclose investigative dot 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 techniques, procedures dot dot dot, not generally known outside of the government if disclosure would interfere with enforcement dot 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 efforts. Right? We don't want people to know how we as a police department necessarily operate on a separate kind of a case. A bank robbery, we don't want people to know that our procedure in dealing with a bank robbery is this is how many units um, respond, this is um, where they will set up um, to, uh, to um, watch over the scene, this is the person, this is the level of staff that will be in command of this situation. Under these circumstances, SWAT gets deployed. Now I recognize that 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 analogy does not relate to this case specifically, but there are, there are things that would be revealed in these police reports that also deal with those types of investigative and um, uh, procedural techniques that police officers engage in in cases like this in a disappearance case. Um, in one of the appeals, and well, in the first level, the first letter that was drafted by the West Valley City Police Department, they also included um, section 63G2305, subsection 10, that says records for which the disclosure of which would jeopardize the life or safety of an individual. Um, you know, you're also able to consider that as well. And the reason why that becomes important is the burden in this case isn't on West Valley City Police, the West Valley City Police Department or West Valley City, which is a wonderful thing for me as a prosecutor. Generally, I deal with burdens beyond a reasonable doubt. It's, it's something I have to prove. In this case, I don't have to. The burden is on the person who is seeking disclosure of this record. Under 63G2406, a record that is classified pr as protected under 63G2305, subsection 9, may be ordered to be disclosed under the position, under the provisions of section, and at least those, list those sections, 
And then it says, only if the person or party seeking disclosure of the record has established by a preponderance of the evidence that the public interest favoring access is equal to or greater than the interest favoring the restriction of access. And then subsection 2 of 63G2406, a record that is classified protected under subsection 63G30510, which is that subsection that talks about the potential of if somebody could end up getting killed as a, as a collateral consequence of this, or their life might be in danger, may be ordered to be disclosed under provisions of this um, act only if the person or party seeking disclosure of the record has established of a greater standard clear and convincing evidence that the public interest favoring access is equal to or greater than the interest favoring restriction of access. It is the position of the West Valley City Police Department that the investigation into the disappearance of Susan Cox Powell, this is not about Josh, is ongoing. Um, it is an active investigation. Um, um, time is being spent, detectives are um, assigned. This is something um, we are not, uh, it is not a closed case, it is an active case, and therefore this request, it is our opinion, should be denied. Thank you. Mr. Falk, did you want to take some time for a rebuttal on this? Okay. Thank you. Again, I'm Nate Carlisle from the Salt Lake Tribune. Um, first of all, let me let me address uh, what he, Mr. Gilmore said about uh, who the burden is on. Again, as Aaron said, Grandma makes crystal clear that the burden is on the government to show why the records should not be disclosed. That the default setting on records in the state is that they are presumed to be opened. Uh, I think what Mr. Gilmore was trying to say is that because the records have been classified uh, as protected, at that point we would have to demonstrate there's still a public interest in re releasing them. We contend that the classification is wrong in the first place and that these should be public documents. Uh, it's only if in good faith you come to some conclusion that uh, some or some of the records are protected, at that point we can make the public interest argument. But first and foremost, we contend that these should be public records. Um, Mr. Gilmore says that this is, uh, sorry, that the investigation being undertaken still by West Valley Police is into the disappearance of Susan Powell. But then he also goes on to talk about what the statute says about criminal investigations for enforcement purposes. Well, which one is it? it if it's strictly a disappearance case, it's not even clear that a crime would have been committed. Uh, they seem to want to argue both sides of that coin there. Um, and also, at this point, uh, I'd, I'd like to hand out something to the council, if I may approach. Um, I have copies for all of you. Okay, what I've handed you are uh, the cover page and then all of page 20 and the first half of page 21. This is the Attorney General's open book. And I, I did check, 2008 was the last time this has been published. It's not been updated since. Um, but uh, I observed no pertinent changes to the protected record section. Uh, you'll see in there that police records are not listed by the Attorney General as protected, specifically protected records. Um, now, the Attorney General's book, admittedly, was meant to summarize the law, but uh, surely had the Attorney General considered police records in just about any circumstance to be protected records, he would have listed them there. He did not do that. Um, uh, 
So let me address some other things Mr. Gilmore said. He, uh, Mr. Gilmore a couple times referred to media interest in the case. It's, it's not just media interest, it's public interest. I'm willing to bet that every member of this council has been stopped by someone in the supermarket, at a ball game, in church, shopping, where have you, to be in some citizen has either made some comment to them or made some inquiry of, inquiry of you about the Powell case. Uh, and Aaron talked about all the average citizens of the city who have helped look for her. Uh, it is far past just media interest in this case. There are honest, average, everyday citizens that have an interest in this matter. Um, Mr. Gilmore talked about how ground law is also a, a management tool for records in the state, and, and that's accurate. Our contention would be that manage is exactly what we're trying to do here. Uh, we think that these records are public and they should be managed as such, or in the alternative, if in good faith you find some of the documents are protected, then those documents, which should be public, should be segregated from there and made public. Right now, we've bunched the whole herd as protected, and that does not seem reasonable. Um, and again, I go back to the point made about how this is an effort to try to, sorry, that the police investigation is trying to find Susan Powell. Surely then, there must be some records which are now obsolete for those purposes now that Josh Powell is deceased. Uh, and I'm, I'm just listing some things here. Uh, maybe some of the recorded interviews are now obsolete, uh, recorded interviews with Josh Powell. Maybe some of the lab reports are now obsolete. Maybe, uh, maybe drawn maps or plans of actions are obsolete, but it's, it's just inconceivable that every record which fits the definition of, of what we've asked for can go directly to locating Susan Powell. Um, and I, at this opportunity, I should point something out. Uh, Aaron earlier said we were here to get records on Josh Powell. That, that's correct, but it's also some shorthand. Our request, which is articulated in the, the packet we gave earlier, asks for records pertaining to Susan Powell and Josh Powell. So it's not just that we're trying to get Josh Powell documents. Though in the case of Josh Powell, obviously, again, he's not being prosecuted for anything. I don't see how uh, a lot of the records going specifically to Josh could assist in finding Susan if, in fact, you consider that a, a good reason to protect some records. Okay. Um, what Mr. Gilmore recited uh, was the protected classifications listed in subchapter 9. And let me just address a few of those. We've spent most of our time on 9A, which uh, I think both parties agree is probably the one which most directly goes to the issues here. Uh, and I'll I've addressed those again. Um, moving down the list through the rest of chapter 9, and those are recited in uh, Aaron's uh, opening remarks that he handed out earlier. Uh, the issue of a fair trial, again, Mr. Josh Powell is not going to be tried for anything, uh, and I think it's presumptive just at this point to assume that anybody is ever going to be charged for a crime connected to Susan Powell. If you read, read the search warrant, which we've attached as documentation, the search warrant that was released in Washington State, there is only one person ever discussed in connection with Susan Powell's actual disappearance, and that was Josh Powell. There is discussion of Susan Powell's father-in-law, but only as it pertains to pornography and voyeurism charges in Washington State. Uh, the actual disappearance itself, again, only Josh Powell was discussed. So I think it's presumptive to think at this point that anyone's ever going to be charged with a crime which would eliminate some of the jury pool concerns, even if for the sake of argument we say that someone's going to be charged with a crime related to Susan Powell, there are still jury pool protections a judge in court can undertake uh, through what's called void dire, which is jury questionnaires to weed out people who've been paying too much attention or have uh, already made up their minds about the case. Uh, jurors can be 
sequestered, I mean, they can move the trial to another county, bring in jurors from another county, what have you. Um, uh, and besides that, I mean, let's face it, a lot of stuff has already been written about this case in the first place. Uh, I think it uh, doesn't make sense that we have a lot more concerns about team jury pool. Um, the the subparagraph in, chap in uh, paragraph 9 about police procedures. Uh, I, I think it's somewhat presumptive to think that we're going to learn something in these documents that the average person can't figure out. For that matter, we already know a lot about the procedures that have been implemented here. We know a GPS device was fixed to Josh Powell's car, and that was tracked for uh, many weeks or months. Uh, we know computers were seized and searched, uh, and even encrypted documents were retrieved from com computers. Uh, we know they interviewed witnesses. We know they traveled uh, to remote locations, conducted systematic searches. Um, I, I just don't see how that's an applicable statute here. Um, let's see. Okay, life and safety of, of a witness not generally known by the, the public. Uh, remember, there's the keyword reasonably all throughout paragraph 9. You have to reasonably have concerns that this could be an issue. I don't think it's reasonable that we'd be concerned about witness retaliation at this point. Again, Josh Powell is dead. His only supporters, to the best of anyone's, uh, has been able to find supporters of him, are all in Washington State, whereas the presumed crime occurred in Utah. Uh, I, I just see no likelihood of any witness retaliation here. Okay. And uh, I'm going to, okay, well, that concludes my rebuttal on this, this goes for paragraph 9. Uh, I would go ahead and say one other thing about the cost issue. Uh, Aaron discussed this a little bit with, uh, we've asked many times for some sort of accounting of how much money has been spent on this. Uh, we've not been provided one. We don't know if one exists. I, I, I take the point that you know, you can't keep the calculator running every time a detective picks up the phone and calls someone for an interview. Uh, but I, I think that we can get a reasonable description of all the resources that were put into this case if these documents are made public and uh, the West Valley citizens can learn a little bit more about how the police resources were spent. I'll, I'll take any questions, otherwise uh, I'll end my rebuttal at this point. Okay, thank you. We'll stand up there. If, if just whatever's quickest for you to get up there, like I said I'll sit on the front row. Please. Yeah. So quick, and I think it's at this point. If we just, if you have questions of, of either party. Uh, of the, yes, I have a question. Actually, I have comments. Yeah. Uh, I listened to uh, Nate Carlisle. Is that right? Yeah. You disagree with me to give more about the public interest is weight heavy than media interest, the press interest, correct? Right. I'm saying it's not just media interest in the case. So I think just no, by, no, no, no. pardon me here, I think by just way of procedure, if you have a question for someone, let's have them come up to the microphone. Yeah. So, so with our recording devices and for future, we have everything documented and recorded and and uh, so, council members, I think you just, if you have a question, call this that person up. And, and can you restate the question? Okay, my question is: You disagree with Mr. Gilmore? Is the public interest way more than media interest? Yes, I do. I think it's much broader than media interest, and the average citizen uh, has an interest in this case and would like uh, uh, a little more accounting of what the police learned and what they found in this case, and, and how they went about investigating the case. Okay. And you also, you mentioned about people are still looking for uh, shoots and power, correct? Because I wrote that here. Yeah, I don't dispute that the police are still trying to find Susan Powell. Yeah, so therefore, boiled out to this argument tonight is Mr. Gilmore is right, because this one is still ongoing active case. So that therefore, he will not release this case out to public. The statute doesn't talk about ongoing and active. It talks about whether the release of documents could reasonably interfere with the investigation. 
Yes, but he also mentioned about people are still looking for Susan Powell. So that means this case still on active. And on active, based on 63G-2305, that means cannot release this record. That's the bottom line. If you're talking about the strict language of the statute, again, active and open is not in that statute. Well, that, that's my comment for tonight. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Carlisle, while you're there. Yes. Um, just for future reference, giving us a page or two of somebody else's summary of the law that's available to us is uh, not persuasive at all. In fact, it makes me feel like uh, not only do I not get the book, I don't get the cliff notes. I just get a little bit that you want me to know, and it's okay. frankly insulting just for well, future reference. Okay, I, I apologize. I only have one copy of the book. You're welcome to review my copy if you like. The book means nothing to me either. Okay. Somebody else's summary of the law. We can read the law, and we can decide on the law. Okay, with respect, I would argue it's, it's the Attorney General's summary. I understand that. Okay. Thank you. Does council have any need of any other questions for any of the either side here? I have uh, questions for Mr. Gilmore. Okay. Mr. Gilmore, how many pages of documents are we talking about? Hundreds. How many hundreds? I, I don't have it. Well, who knows? Who looked at these and said, this document needs to be protected, this document needs to be protected, this one's okay, this one needs to be protected? Um, let me clarify a couple of things. I know um, that even the, there are multiple search warrants and search warrant affidavits that were a part of the original request by um, the appellant, um, Aaron Falk. Those are actually in the custody of the district court. Um, the district court still has those under seal. Those alone, just those documents, not the police reports that were created, are in the hundreds. Um, if you let, me, let me stop you there. So those documents are not available to us to release? Um, they are under seal by the district court as of today's date. And what would, have, what would we have to do to access those documents to have them released to the public? Um, they, um, the court would have to make a determination about those documents uh, on whether or not uh, that a, a similar kind of analysis. So who, who would uh, make that motion to the court? Um, an interested party, in this case the Salt Lake Tribune. Okay, so... And in fact, if this, if the, if this were to, appeal, to be appealed one step further, it would be this grandma request would also go to the district court. Right, but we're now talking about one set of documents that's under seal and other documents that are not under seal by the district court. Is that correct? These documents are grandma documents. These are police reports. They, these are not court documents. Okay. They are West Valley City Then let's not documents. talk about the court documents. The only reason I bring it up is because you're asking about the numbers of documents. I'm, I'm saying, hey, there's lots of documents. I, yeah, so I'm sure there are lots of documents Hundreds of in the world. No, in re related hey, to this case. I'd like to know, Mr. Gilmore, how many documents are we talking about that are responsive to the grandma request? In a number of the documents, I, I, can, I can get back with you with an answer. How many boxes? How many reams? How many folders? How many documents are we talking about? Has anybody determined that? No. Well, we're, we're uh, denying the request. We don't know what, uh, we haven't looked at the documents and said, hey, this, we can't release this, or yeah. nobody's made that determination? Well, the determination, the, term, the determination is being made based on the fact that it is an ongoing investigation, and this is why. If I am a person who gets charged with a crime, if I know what the state knows already prior to getting charged with the crime and being interviewed in conjunction with an investigation about a crime, that puts me at a, uh, a great advantage and the state at a great disadvantage in conducting that investigation. Now, whenever we're talking about this ongoing investigation and the documents that are generated, um, it is, uh, the case file is, is large. How large is the case file? You know, 
I, I'll have to get back with you to... Well, this is the time set for the hearing. We're going to decide tonight whether we release these documents, and you're saying they shouldn't be any released, and you haven't looked at them as far as I can tell, and nobody knows how many documents there are? I haven't reviewed all of the documents we have. I don't know how many, how many pages are in this, involved in this specific report, so I don't have How many detectives do we have assigned? Approximately. It varied anywhere from several, several, two or three to six or seven. Or and, or and speaking, documents are being created almost on a daily basis in, in, in reference to this case. Well, I don't think we have to release future documents that haven't been created yet, do we? But you're asking me to put a number on something that... Well, in response to the grandma request, which was made some time ago, how many documents are we talking about? No, I, I'd have to. I'd have to come back. To of that. these numerous documents, the number of which we do not know, mm -hmm. how many of these documents have been determined that if they were released, they would interfere with enforcement of the law, either by percentage or by number of documents? Is anybody? How many of these documents would interfere? That's your defense with the enforcement of the law. It would, it would be our defense with the enforcement of our or our criminal investigation. I, I'm going to ask you about each one of these because oh. I want to know specifically how many documents would interfere with the enforcement of the law. That's your, one of your defenses. It would be our position that any and all documents would interfere with the ongoing investigation. And who reviewed any and all documents and made that determination for each document? The lead detective um, on, can I say that? Investigative team. The lead um, person, or the, can I say his name? Lead, det lead detective and investigative team. Um, and the investigative team is Phil Quinlan. Whenever I spoke with Detective Quinlan about this, um, he indicated that any and all documents could potentially jeopardize the ongoing investigation. And of these numerous documents, the number of which we do not know, uh, did you just say would interfere with investigation? Yes. That wasn't my question. Okay. One of your bases was the enforcement of the criminal law. The other basis was the investigation. Are these things separate or are they combined? So you're asking me the enforcement of the of criminal proceedings? Yes, as you spoke to us, I wrote down notes. You said one of the reasons we can't release them is if they would interfere with the enforcement of criminal proceedings. I wrote that down. Okay. You said one of the reasons would be they would interfere with the investigation. Right, because like, you're saying enforcement of the law um, well, I, I, so how many, you, so Mr. Quinlan, any of them, said any. all of them would interfere with the enforcement? Yes, Your Honor. I mean, yes, sir. Your Honor's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, with respect to the investigation, how many of these numerous documents, my number or percentage, have been determined to, if they were, they were released, would interfere with the in ongoing investigation? All of them. And that determination was made by whom? By the, the investigative team. And you're telling me tonight that after the grandma request, somebody looked at every page of these numerous, numberless, countless documents and decided every page would interfere with the ongoing investigation. Um, what I am telling you is that the way that police work works is that you do not reveal what it is that you know to a potential <clears throat> target of a criminal investigation. You do not know ahead of time what piece of information that you have obtained from whatever source will end up leading to um, criminal charges um, based on an investigation. You just don't know. Thank you for that statement. However, it was not responsive to my question. Please state it again because I want to be responsive. Well, I, I, I'm asking you how many of these documents were determined. All of them. All of them. And, and that's what you're telling me. I understand that. Is what I, that. that is what I'm of these numerous, numberless, countless documents, documents without number, how many were determined that they would disclose a source and jeopardize that source? Certainly the source doesn't appear on every page of every document. Certainly it does not. So how many of these were determined in the grandma request review that they cannot be released because they would uh, disclose a source that needs to be protected? Um, we did not number them by each subsection. How much by percentage or? We did not. Um, any any, any, any way at all that we can judge, we need to protect these documents to protect a source. How, how are we supposed to judge that? 
how are you supposed to judge whether that's your defense these documents should be protected because they would disclose a source I'm asking how many documents need to be protected and what I'm saying is all of the documents need to be protected and that we have not done an individual line-by-line breakdown of each of the documents based on the subsections of the code in which you are trying well, to say. you're not arguing that every subsection applies to every document are you I am I am arguing that subsection um, 9a applies to all of the documents and subsection 9a is what is interfere with an in investigation um, undertaken for um, for enforcement since these documents have not been specifically reviewed to apply to each subsection, has there been a determination that there is any other subsection besides 9A that also applies to all of the documents? They could potentially interfere with enforcement proceedings. They could uh, potentially not, not, please not potentially. Have you determined, has anybody from the police department determined that there is another subsection that's going to apply to all the documents? If we could dedicate the resources of you know, 20 police officers to go through each of these documents line by line, identify line by line um, which subsections each of the lines could potentially um, apply to that could be uh, contemplated. Sure. And um, we don't want to spend the money on that perhaps, but I guess that means the answer is no. We haven't determined any subsection other than 9A applies to all of the documents. 9A, 9B, 9C. And 9B is what? Enforcement proceedings. And 9C is what? Impartial hearing and a fair trial. So none of these documents can be released without jeopardizing an impartial hearing and fair trial for some as yet unnamed suspect of some as yet unnamed crime. It, uh, Not would, one single document. It would create the danger of depriving a person of a right to a fair trial, yes. And it could reasonably be expected to interfere with an enforcement proceeding, yes. What if the Salt Lake Tribune paid the West Valley Police Department to go through these documents and look at each one and decide which ones could be released without uh, violating any of these subsections? Is there any reason not to release them then? That would be, it would be awesome if we could have somebody pay for us to go line by line through these documents um, and then identify for you line by line um, which sections um, should still um, remain undisclosed per the statute. Let me tell you what I would do if this was a uh, court matter and I were the judge, mm -hmm. which I'll never be. <laughs> I would take these documents into my office and I would make that review. Mm -hmm. And I would release every document that could be released. If there was a name on some document that I could scratch out and release the rest, I would do that. Right. Is there any reason under Grandma that this body could not conduct that? review is there any reason is there is that is that against the law for this body to do that acting as judges on this appeal to review these documents and redact them ourselves no sir you have that ability under our ordinance to review all the documents in camera that's all the questions i have thank you it's a pleasure any other questions Any other questions of the council here on either side? Any questions of uh, Mr. Bunderson, uh, city? city uh... Just for clarity, I, I, I believe this is understood, but um, yes, sir. In, in, a, in the first uh, request, grammar request, there was a mention of a search warrant, and, and just so there's no assertion uh, that we have dropped that language, completely understand that that's under the jurisdiction of the city, so just for clarity's sake. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions here, Mr. Bunderson? On did you on that? I guess I had one, you know, to this, and it it's, it comes along the the same line of questioning here. With t today, Mr. Falk comes up and talks about well, if if uh, you see fit to you know to, to uphold the denial, maybe a redacted form or partials could be. But I guess where I struggle with that is that is is the request here? Is it it's for the whole ball of wax, or for is it? For whatever we can give them. Sorry. From what I understand, in his uh, request, he, he is up front requesting the whole ball of wax. But then, um, at at the, at the end of his uh, let's call it a brief, he does 
say if, if you do find some of them protected, um, then please release the others to us, just as he's made in his argument tonight. Um, which, again, you have the authority to do under our ordinance. And is that the appropriate time or place for, a, a, I guess, an amendment to a grandma request at this point? Because, I mean, at first it was a whole ball of wax, and oh. now it's, well, whatever whatever we can get. I mean, is it, would this be the time or place to, to amend that? Because like I said, I, 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 the thing that I often say is that I try to evaluate each ordinance, each resolution, in this case, each uh, you know, uphold or denial based on what it is and what it isn't. And so, you know, is it... Is it, am I looking at the whole thing, or is it is an amendment appropriate at this that, point? And it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, the, I, I guess the, the short circuit answer to that is that you have the ability to do that no matter what he asks. He can ask for the whole thing, and you as the council can decide to give him part of it back. Mr. Bunnerson, I have a question, please. Sure. As far as our deliberations, do they take place now? Do they take place in public? Um, you have five days, five business days, to return um, your decision. And you are allowed, if you have taken in all the evidence, if there is no more, if there are no more questions and no more facts that you need to take in, you're allowed to deliberate in private on this matter. And are those deliberations uh, closed or are they open? They're closed. Are they close to members of the council that are not in attendance tonight? That, that's not contemplated by the, um, by the ordinances or the statutes that I've read, um, and I haven't seen any case law on that. I would, I would think probably not, um, just like it's, it's hard to exclude a, a member from, from certain things. Okay. Um, but, but that member who's missing certainly could not um, ask for any more facts. He would be limited to review of the record that we've seen here tonight. Okay, so if somebody misses a study meeting, they can still vote at the regular meeting next, okay. next week. And is that uh, review to be determined by a majority vote, four votes? That's how I would recommend you do it, yes. Thank you. Uh, like Councilman Bueller, I, I have some questions in regards to uh, uh, Mr. Carlisle made, made the comment that uh, it would be reasonable to release the costs, uh, the resources that were used, and those types of things, uh, I'm not sure that jeopardizes the, their case. And I know that the public uh, is interested in those things. And, and again, on the same lines, I'm certain that there's got to be documents uh, that are not permanent to um, the safety and, and the interference of the investigation and those things. Um, the question is, is, is who's responsible to go through that line by line? I guess that would be our responsibility to do that and make that determination. You do have the ability to do that, yes. And do we not have the ability to delegate that to somebody else? Mm -hmm. uh, the police department? The ordinance indicates that the council may review the uh, documents in question in camera. Um, it's silent on whether the delegation can happen. I imagine um, if that is the council's will that the staff would make that happen. And can we delegate the cost? In uh, terms of how much money this is going to cost to review? Someone's going to have to put time in to review these things. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Under Grandma, you're allowed to... Um, Not charge. just charge for the copies, but charge for the time, going through the records, and so forth. And can we make that charge before we... I mean, can we estimate that cost and get a check before we spend 500 hours reviewing these documents? We do that all the time, yes. Thank you. So this is, I guess, the point of the meeting where, you know, any comments, any further questions, or any motions? Uh, I, I do. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, Mr. Gilmore, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, I do believe this case is on go on active case. Yeah, but I uh, would love to see next time you got prepared more detail, clear before you come to the hearing. Okay. That'd be awesome. 
it, it was one of those things I thought I was here to argue, um, argue the law, and not necessarily argue a bunch of facts. Um, and so we'll take that into consideration. And keep in mind, I've been at this job less than a year. And, uh, and I believe this is the second appeal that has gotten to the city council. Um, so with that um, excuse, I take, your, I take your admonishment to heart. Okay. Mr. Gilmore, I think you, you did a great job. I don't think you should apologize or be embarrassed or you need to stand up for yourself. Yeah. I yeah. try. I try. I'm trying to stand up for the West Valley PD. Don't let anybody browbeat you. Oh, unless he's a city councilman. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, if you're right, you're right. It doesn't matter who's talking to you. All right. As we mentioned, our new employees will be a place of definite learning. We give you those opportunities. So we all that, that, That's all I have. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Know, I, I guess one comment that I want to make is that I, you know, I've never felt so inadequate to make a decision on anything in my entire life. Whether I mean, even even because uh, you know, on one hand, we have uh, the Tribune, which a lot of their arguments are are based with the word presumptively, and then the city comes back with the, that it's potentially. So I'm trying to weigh whether it's presumptively this or potentially that. And you know it's it's it, it makes it a tough call, and then the uh, you know it basically just comes down to you know what uh, you know what is the greater public good on this, and is it to uh, the public's right to know, and and I, I know the the uh, hurdle we're trying to get over here is is equal to or greater than, and you know with potentially versus presumptively, you know it's. It, you know it's fairly equal but I guess the one thing that gives me some solace in all this is that you know I know that there is uh, with open records and with uh, court cases and trials that uh, there are uh, active uh, procedures checks and balances and uh, internal external reviews and and uh, how they can run their course and so I also worry about I guess getting into uh, upsetting any of these checks and balances or, or reviews that uh, that in my mind would be the greatest uh, detriment to, to public good and so I mean I, I guess I'm just kind of talking out loud here to, to some of my points to maybe just uh, you know spur on uh, some of yours or, or a motion of, of how you best would think that it would be uh, in our best interest to proceed and and so, Councilman Christensen? We've, we've made some suggestions here. Let, let me just flat out ask Mr. Falk, would the Tribune be willing to pay the estimated cost of going through all these records? That Numberless, question. countless <laughs> records. Bottomless sea. Uh, that question is, is certainly far above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> and, and mine. <laughs> if, if uh, I believe if you if you came, obviously I mean, our hope would be that, that it could be done without that. Um, if you had to come back with some sort of cost estimate, that, that would certainly be a, a great start for for us. I mean, I, I can't write you a blank check. You would it would balance. Uh, I, I, what I'm saying is, you know, if the the council comes back and says yes, but we need to re go uh, through and redact, and, and that will be a cost and we come back with a, an estimated cost, would, I, I think would that you want to carry it that far? I, 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 I believe so, but I, I could not speak with absolute certainty. I, I, don't have, I simply don't have that authority within my uh, company. Um, but I, I, I know it is of great interest uh, to both public and, and to media, which we are a part of, we are, we're average citizens as well. But uh, I, I believe that would be uh, something to consider very, very seriously for my, for my superiors. Thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I move that we set a time and place for deliberations, and I would suggest that it take place at the conclusion of this meeting, since we only have five days. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Second. Okay, so a motion and a second. Can I ask one more? Dis okay. Yeah, discussion to so other questions. Can we, outside of this forum, get that information from the police of approximately the number of papers? approximately how much man hour will take because as our responsibility I don't think it should be the citizens of West Valley that pay for that cost of going through all those documents so we can get that outside without them and then just give them the estimate yes that's appropriate yes. okay well, well, well I'd like a, a comment there 
whether it's possible is a qu one question. Whether it's appropriate is That's a whole another question. Appropriate, yeah, for us to get that information. Yeah, which I would, I would ask you if we're going to have this deliberation um, in a closed session or closed discussion, that would be the place to discuss that. Okay. okay. So we have a motion on the floor to uh, go into deliberations immediately following business of the day. Is there any discussion to that motion for or against? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the question on that. Ms. McKendrick, we do a roll call vote. Mr. Vincent? Yes. Mrs. Lane? Yes. Mr. Bueller? Aye. Mr. Yes. Mr. Christensen? Yes. Mayor Yes. Aye. Okay, motion carries, and we'll continue these deliberations on. And thank you for your, for your time on this. And Mr. Bunderson, is there any other uh, directions that uh, we need to give to the applicant or to the city uh, representative uh, as, as we proceed with this. May I ask what? Go ahead. Does that mean you anticipate an announcement tonight, or what's the procedure? I think we're going to reserve our, I guess, our five days on this. And I, I mean, I can't speak for the rest of it. It's going to go. So, I mean, okay. it could be thirty seconds. It could be five days. So, I think our timing is part of our deliberation. Yeah. Okay. All right, and uh, well, I, you know, I mean, would that mean potentially there's another hearing scheduled where you would announce your decision, or we get notified we, by the mail? We've got all the facts, right? Yeah. We, we won't be taking any more any more facts on right. this. I mean, that, and so, uh, is there a point where we have to come back into a, an open session to, to vote on it, or anything to that point? What you're required to do after deliberations is issue an order, um, which I'm, I'm happy to help you prepare. Um, but the I want to say thank you to Mr. Fork. I mean, so Mr. Carla is tonight the young person to come here and try to pursue this case. I appreciate that very much. Thank you and thank to all of you. Yeah. Uh, maybe just this more quick. Does that mean we should stick around tonight? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's. It, you win? <laughs> well, it like says it all. It's, yeah. it's, it's certainly your right to, and, you know, or yeah. there's plenty of places across the street to entertain yourself, or, <laughs> but I mean, it's. It's okay. really your call. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have item 10. Is, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> well we have some uh, exciting consent agenda items on uh, city manager's appointments to various committees uh, across the city. A, uh, a motion on those consent items would be appropriate at this point. Mr. Mayor, I'll move for approval of the consent agenda. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the appointments of the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that appears to be unanimous. Uh, no need for executive session. No, sir. Okay. Then uh, this body will stand adjourned. I will call to order the um, special meeting of the RDA. Note that roll call has been taken and member Winder is absent. We have had an opening ceremony. We have one resolution before us, uh, Mr. Pyle. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have with us this evening Mr. Morey, who is going to uh, give you a description and go through some steps that uh, we're contemplating uh, upon the board's approval or the agency's approval to initiate an herbal, urban renewal survey. This is in the 5600 West, 3500 South area, which you know probably better as where the old uh, Albertsons uh, grocery store is and the Rite Aid drugstore was. Uh, also previously the Salvation Army, the Kerner, the Sears, the Kmart, all of those. Uh, Kmart is still there. Kmart was there, was gone, now it's back. Yes, so uh, we've had quite a bit of turnover in that area. So anyway, uh, this step would be the first in a series if it uh, if the agency is so disposed uh, to move it along towards redevelopment goals and, and plans and projects that we develop later. Mr. Morris, on a much lighter note, um, one of the responsibilities we have within economic development, of course, is to not only bring businesses to the community, but to be evaluating what's going on in the community and which areas may or may not need our attention. And I'm sure that you all are aware, like we are, that this is a key intersection in our community right there at 35th. Um, south and 56th West and there's a lot of activity going on to the north end of that with the development of Target and all the retail around there and we're beginning to notice quite a bit of transition right around the 35th South 56th West um, intersection as Wayne's already commented we've got some transition with Kmart 
um, and Sears, there's some of the other retailers right around there are going through that same process. So we just wanted to take a closer look at that and one of the one of the um, important steps that we take, we can informally go out as staff and just look at whatever we want to, but if the potential were to exist in that area for some kind of a redevelopment area or for a redevelopment opportunity that we feel or you feel is appropriate for us to be engaged in, the first step is that we designate a survey area. And so the map that you see before you just represents a large area, excluding any residential, where we think we ought to look. The, the map does not suggest in any way that all of that area um, um, has an issue that we need to look at, but it's, it's better at the beginning to take a broad brush and to look at as much as possible so that you can determine should we scale it back, is there anything that should be done here at all, is there anything that we've missed. So what the survey area resolution does is it allows us to engage a consultant to begin to look more deeply into what's happening in that area. And so that's what's before you tonight. And at the point that uh, you engage a consultant, you would come back with another uh, proposal to the, the uh, authority to then spend money for that? No, basically what, what this does, uh, that we, we've already, the city has uh, you know, several groups that we work with um, in a situation like this. Um, we go out initially and say, um, this is an area that we're kind of concerned about. Um, what are your thoughts? And that, that person has helped us draft this map just to kind of make sure that we're on the right page. Um, they've estimated what some, some of the costs could be to go, to go through that process. And um, so by adopting this resolution, we would go ahead and allow that person, that company, to begin the research so that at some point we could bring that back to you and say, yeah, we have an issue here, or no, we don't. Everything looks like it's moving the way it ought to, and there's no reason for us to be involved. Because I know there's there's no uh, fiscal impact on the. No, there would be. I mean, the the survey analysis that they do, you know, will probably cost somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars, and and they've estimated those costs. Um, so it just depends on on the the level of detail that they have to go through or what or what they find and we kind of have an estimate of that and we would begin to once you've adopted this we would begin to cost out what those what those fees include and, and what needs to be done so, so the main purpose of this is just to set the boundaries that's correct exactly right as far as the boundary goes uh, i'm just curious uh, if you move that eastern line down to uh, 50 uh, 200 west, keep going down to the south. Then Wayne's house would be in, inside this. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I, I know you were you were joking. One of the key elements of what we want to do, though, is to not include residential, and so we've tried to make sure that we, we have done that. But uh, how does well, this area overlap? I'm sorry, Steve. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just, how does this overlap with the Hunter Town Center plans? Which very close, actually. It includes close. a lot so, of the same area. So I want to talk about this, and I'll laser you here. So this is the interchange on the Mountain View Corridor. That's cool. Here, That's correct. Spot one. So we've actually included the the restaurant as well as the, the shoe store kind of in the study area, even though that one day it will be an intersection. That's right. I mean, just because we want to look at all that property and determine what's what's going on, what's happening, we recognize that that's a key intersection, especially once the Mountain View corridor is completed, because it'll be one of the main entrances off of that corridor into West Valley City. So, we want to be able to look at everything around that. Okay, and then with that, I mean, I can I can appreciate the the fact that we're trying to keep residential out of it, but I mean, with these houses that have frontage right on Thirty Fifth South, I mean. Since it's a study area, what it might not be a good idea just to at least include that in um, as a study. I know other study areas that we put into it seems like there's been a street here or there, or maybe a handful of residences that we thought. Uh, anyway, your thoughts. Well, the on redevelopment that? law has been has really been restricted so much that what we're contemplating here, if, if if anything were to happen at all, you're talking more about an urban renewal area and not a redevelopment area, and so in that case. Excluding residential is essential. I mean, you, you know, if we don't, we, we're not allowed really to consider that. You're, you're talking about commercial office space, that kind of space, and, and what the redevelopment need or opportunity is. Well, the, the one thing I'm worried about when you talk about residential is again that same line I was referring to uh, on the eastern side. 
although their homes aren't in that, their property, because most of those have pro uh, agricultural property that will fall in that, that space. So maybe their homes won't, but their backyard property that is where they keep their horses and those items, that area certainly falls in, the, in that area. And so I know all those people on that road are, are not going to be happy campers, just like they weren't happy when we presented the Hunter Town Center. Do you know the, the zoning of, I mean, this used to be the nur uh, nursery at some nursery. point in these, yeah. you know, I mean, do you know the zoning on on these off chance? You know, honestly, I really don't. I apologize. Um, I don't know if Nicole does. Yeah, right. Uh, right now, that particular parcel is zoned commercial. It's zoned the lowest commercial, which is C1. So it's kind of in a holding zone specific to that site right now. And has been zoned that way for quite some time. That was out of so however long it's been. I'm wondering why, I mean, I understand the area that uh, is of concern is the old Sears and whatever's over there. But the area that's drawn is double that, and I'm wondering why it goes so gone to the east side of the road, and why it goes so far to the south. Well, I understand again. The survey area resolution is just the area that we're looking at, and part of being able to evaluate what's happening in an area is to be able to look at the surrounding property as well. I mean, for example, we started looking at that at this just primarily because of some of the things that we saw happening in and around the Sears Kmart site, but now we're noticing that some of the retail property to the south of that intersection. The south of 35th South is also in transition as well, and I think that's just a, it's key, it's a key opportunity for us to look at everything that's going on around there to determine. I mean, redevelopment is most productive when we're proactive. I mean, if we wait until something negative has happened, it's much harder to be responsive or to, or to make an effective change. And so, if we can look at everything right now and determine maybe it's headed in a positive direction, it doesn't need anything from, from us. But if we miss that opportunity, it'll be much harder in the future to kind of take it back. Then is this, uh, the next step after this would be a blight hearing? Well, what we would do is we, if we determined that there was a need, we would come back and we would define what the actual, for example, urban renewal boundary was to be at that point. So, and we would have another discussion about, do we agree? Are we talking about the right area? What, what's the purpose of the redevelopment area? So point? then just because this is the study area, this is not necessarily that's exactly fixed right. in stone. This isn't going to be the area for anything that, else that we can That's exactly. I mean, we may come back to you in uh, you know, a month or two and say, everything's great. Nothing needs to happen at all. Or we may come back to you and say this one little corner um, needs our attention. And, and how long? And how long are you gonna come back? Uh, uh, my question is, uh, how long can you come back and uh, let us know about this project you have been studying? Uh, you know, we haven't set a time frame, but usually, especially with a project like this, like we're anticipating that sometime in the next uh, couple of months, uh -huh. we'll have a better feeling of what's happening, and we would start to define if there was a project area or not. Tom and Steve, if I can add in real quick, and sorry to interrupt you there, Steve. Steve, I just wanted to, sorry, I'm using the full name there. <laughs> just to differentiate in my own little mind there, uh, just to get a comment in before we move on, I just wanted to make the point that uh, a couple or more of you may not have been here the last time we did one of these uh, and started a re the study and surveying for actually enacting an RDA, yeah. or a redevelopment area, per se. And these processes do take a long time. I'm glad uh, Keith mentioned a couple of months. It could be more than that. Depending on the size of the geography and the, the survey could take a long time. And then the steps after that take a, a long time as well. So this will be an ongoing process over a number of months. The other comment I wanted to make on the geography was, uh, and Keith actually made good commentary uh, about the differing areas and the different levels of development or need for redevelopment. But going specifically to Steve's question, I just wanted to point out that a lot of those parcels there south of 35th and 56th, I know that the Kmart and Albertsons and all that have been kind of what have really sparked our interest in going. But most of those parcels in that, that area, the acreage that's shown there, is in as bad or worse shape than, than that corner is. And I was just going to make, make a comment that uh, on the south side of, of 35th and west of 56th, where uh, the Blockbuster is now going out of business. Right. And a couple of that strip mall is not what you would call one of, the, one of the greatest uh, pieces in the city. Uh, to the to the east of 56 West, though, and 
you know, it's mostly open land, it's agriculture, it's horse property, it's so. But even, even on the, the north side of 35th and uh, east of 56, there's some vacant properties that are along there as you go, as you move east. So it's kind of that whole intersection is, and, and I, you know, and that's what we're trying to do is to, to look at an area. And I, I think the tool, the redevelopment tools have been well used in the city. They've been used in the, in the appropriate manner. I don't think they've been misused or mismanaged. I think we can look at the redevelopment areas and economic development areas that we've done, and we've seen great benefits uh, as a result of that. And, and adding to that comment, Steve, we also know that as beneficial as most or if not all of those projects have been, as Keith pointed out, you want to get as early a start as you can because they take years, literally, by the time you start surveying, by the time you actually see redevelopment. Just one more question. How, how would, does this affect uh, uh, the potential of uh, the bus rapid transit platform right in that space right there where we're normally talking about really close to where the Albertsons was is where we we're talking where that platform was going to be. And I don't know how that fits into this. Or... Well, I guess the way I would respond to that, and sorry to kind of jump in there, Keith, but I would say the bus rapid transit plan probably will have more effect on the survey than vice versa. I don't think the survey is going to significantly alter the, the design or at least the concept as UTA holds it for the bus rapid transit line. But the existence of the line certainly will affect the survey and how we conduct it. Just the one thing I'm concerned about um, 31st and LaSalle and 5600 West. There's a strip mall, a couple of strip mall there. I, I believe is there are now uh, tenants and right now business. I think it's a very uh, vacant right there. And I'm pretty concerned about if we, we do more strip malls in this area, maybe we uh, lose some money. You know, we I know we try to generate the income into our city, but uh, I'm concerned so many tri strip malls in that area between 3100 South and 3500 South in uh, 5600 West. Yeah, and I agree. That's kind of what drew our attention to to this is is the transition that a lot of those retail spaces are going through. Um, it's not the city's responsibility to become a developer, but what what we can begin to do is to evaluate what's good and what's bad and, and if we and if we begin to exercise the, the opportunity that we have as a city can we make an effective change to to uh, to help things um, either stay good or, or improve and, and so that's what we would be looking at is, okay. is first of all what's going on and is there something we can do to make an effective change if there's I mean if it's okay we'll, we'll step away and we'll give a great report to the City Council that everything looks okay um, if it's not, we'll, it'll be our responsibility to start to make recommendations on what could be done or how we could get involved to make a to make a good change. Ms. Lang. And the potential on these homes, there's like six homes along 5600 West. So we would maybe make a plan as to what could go in in the future, but not demand them to sell and become commercial. If they want to stay there, they can stay there. That, that's correct. Okay. The, the possibility of uh, eminent domain is always just that, a possibility, but it doesn't necessitate it, and that's certainly never been the, the thrust the even of, the, of any of the RDA areas that we've established. Um, a question, we, question, and then I make a motion too. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, if, just for my own memory, maybe for the benefit of some of our new trustees, if we could get just the map or the outline kind of of the long range plan for this Hunter Town Center area just so we kind of know what kind of the start and the end is. Absolutely. Might just be a good refresher and, and then with that I, I think the area looks great and so I'm excited to, to get the ball rolling on this so I move approval of resolution 1207. Second. Okay we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Senate's unanimous. Looking order business. Jerry, we are the